Hello and welcome to our webinar. Uh, we're speaking today on um, point of care testing um, and we're focusing on ED practitioners and lab directors and uh, I'm happy you all could join us for this point of care webinar sponsored by Abbott. Um, feel free to um, ask any questions you may have uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, which you'll find in, on your screen. My name is Chris Devlantes. I'm um, the Senior Director of Global Medical Affairs at Abbott Point of Care. I'm an emergency physician, and I would like to introduce the first uh, speaker in our webinar um, today, Dr. Um, Davapalani Alagapan, who is a consultant uh, in the emergency department in Chennai, India, and uh, he works at the Apollo Hospitals. And um, he's going to be speaking uh, about point of care and his practice in emergency medicine. And uh, after that, I will be speaking as well on the uh, impact of point of care testing in the emergency department in my practice in the United States. So without further ado, I will let uh, Dr. Davapalani uh, go ahead and introduce himself and start his presentation. So thank you very much everyone for joining our webinar. We hope it'll be very informative to you. And I will see you in a little bit uh, uh, after the presentation begins. So thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the introduction. Um, I work in an ED in Chennai, in the southern part of India. Uh, we do have a wide variety of emergency presentations. Um, POCT is where introduced into our department uh, 12 years ago, and they've really been a huge uh, game changer. I'm just going to give you some actual examples of how they have contributed to our decision making. Okay. I mean, in most EDs, they are used to facilitate a safe discharge, particularly in the Western EDs. I used to work in the UK. So we used point of care essentially to see who can be safely be pushed out of the ED. And that's one of the indications. Uh, here in India, where there's lots of cost constraints with the patients, at the same time, we need to do the right thing with the patient all the time. So to reduce expensive investigations, like if you want to really see uh, if the patient has got a pulmonary embolism, you think it's, there's a very low likelihood you might do a, uh, you, you might follow a clinical decision rule and you use a D-dimer and then save some money. I'm not doing a CTPE, not just money, the radiation effects, of course. Um, and most of our ED presentations are time critical and POCTs have a huge role in aiding us with the rapidity of the decision making. So they help us uh, make the decision swift and clear. Um, so again, I'm going to reiterate this with some examples. And so let me just move on to our first clinical scenario. So we had a 52-year-old gentleman who was otherwise fit and well. He was an automobile engineer and he had gradual breathing difficulty over a period of three days. His attendance were pretty recent when we had done away with the COVID, even though we did think of uh, a viral pneumonia or any other pneumonia as a possibility. So he presented pretty recently. He was even breathless to walk a few yards um, and he denied having had any fever or bringing up any sputum or having had a cough. He did not have any chest pain either. His only presentation was that he was finding it difficult to breathe. Um, he had no recent surgeries, no cough or leg pain, and he wasn't on any medications. Uh, the only surgical history he had was that he has had an appendicectomy as a child. He was quite uh, a bit in respiratory distress. Um, his, uh, he was tachycardic at 120 beats per minute. Room air saturations were only 83. Uh, and even with 10 liters of oxygen, uh, his SATs didn't go beyond 95. 
Um, his blood pressure, however, was okay at 120-90, and he was tachypneic at 24. So, uh, his chest examination, however, did not give us any clues. He had good air entry both sides with no added sounds, um, and his heart sounds were normally heard, and there were no additional murmurs. Um, abdomen examination was otherwise unremarkable. No clinical signs of DVT or no leg swelling. So, so ECG did show that uh, he was tachycardic and there was a right bundle branch block uh, and there were T inversions, even though they were non specific, it was widespread. So, this was really trying to make us think if it could be a pulmonary embolism. So he had quite a few features in the ECG. Um, so his lactates were five. Uh, th these were our point of care test results. I have put down the actual blood gases of the man. Um, his troponin was 0.88. Uh, our cutoff is 0.08. Uh, the chest X-ray was unremarkable. Clear lung field with no pointers to why he was so hypoxemic. Um, his echo did show that his RV on the right side of the heart was dilated. RV dilatation was visible. So this was uh, what we had by way of our point of care testing. So our working diagnosis was, uh, the first diagnosis was of course a PE. The diagnosis was reasonably straightforward. Uh, we also had pneumonia in the back of our mind, but the Chest X-ray, as I said, did not reveal any shares consolidation. Um, so we went ahead and did a CTPE as he was uh, uh, in scoring high and the probability was quite high. We went ahead directly with the CTPE. And as you all can see, uh, he's got uh, clots in both his main right and left main pulmonary arteries. So the the straightforward bit was to diagnose his PE. So now came the debate of whether we need to thrombolyze him or anticoagulate him. So we are all aware that um, uh, most of the guidelines, he simplified his score uh, was two. I mean, anything more than one is significant. So he had a significant PC score. Um, so to thrombolyze uh, the European Society of Cardiology, uh, and even the American guidelines would go with a shock, a hemodynamic instability as one of the key factors in letting us decide whether they need to be thrombolyzed. But this gentleman, however, did not have any hypotension. So we were uh, really debating, do we just anticoagulate him despite him being sick uh, with uh, so profound hypoxemia uh, and RV dilatation and the top race. So the, we applied the rule and he, he was classed as intermediate high risk as he had the C severity more than one and he had RV dysfunction and he had uh, elevated drops. So you can clearly see uh, the, the right thing was done by the patient here that he was, we went ahead and thrombolized him. So it's not just aiding with the diagnosis but aiding us with getting the right thing done by this chap and he was uh, thrombolized and he did do well after that subsequently in the coronary care unit. So, so th this uh, flow chart tells us that he's uh, intermediate high risk and we need to contemplate reperfusion, which we did. Um, so he was thrombolized with actylase and he was admitted. Um, so I'll move on to the next case. Uh, this story is a bit peculiar to our settings. So we do uh, he came in in the winter months. This was a few months ago um, when it was, we don't really have a proper winter in India, but what I meant was the rainy seasons. So with rain comes waterborne illnesses in Chennai. Uh, and this man was a traveler. Uh, he was traveling for religious reasons and he had a friend with him and they were staying in a lodge. And it's difficult to ascertain that you get, um, what to say, Drink, safe drinking water, portable drinking water is available during the rainy season. 
So this man came to us with several episodes of loose watery stools. He was so tired and weak that he couldn't stand it anymore. He was very reluctant to come to the hospital, but he was dragged on to us by his friend. He had reduced urine output. He was really clinically dry and he hasn't passed urine for the last 12 hours on questioning. Several episodes of loose large quantity stools. So we see quite a few of these in those months and this gentleman had all clinical signs of dehydration, his sunken eyeballs and his lips were fissured uh, with the dryness uh, and he was tachycardic, extremely tachycardic, hypotensive uh, and tachypneic possibly from the acidosis. Um, so this man again, uh, so we, we couldn't find uh, no signs of peritonism in his abdomen on examination. Uh, he was diffusely tender, but nevertheless soft. Um, and his other systems examinations were unremarkable. So we did a venous gas and it shows that uh, he had profound metabolic acidosis with some respiratory compensation. And his lactates were really high at 7.85. And uh, the chemistry panel did confirm that he had an acute kidney injury. His creatinine was 2.8, one being a cutoff, um, and his uh, potassium was 5.32. So he had AKI. Um, so we carefully administered some fluids. He had a free renal AKI. So he was commenced on normal saline, carefully listening to his chest, and gradually, I mean, we, we had to give him lots of fluids, and we gave him four liters over the first two hours with careful urine output monitoring. And he started making urine after two hours. The biggest problem we had with this man was he was from a different part of the country and he wasn't, he had nobody here and he was so adamant that he didn't want to get admitted to the hospital. Um, he just wanted uh, something to stop his diarrheal, diarrhea and he wanted to be on his way. So despite us trying to explain how ill he was, he wasn't buying it. So he was in shock. He had an AKI. And to top it all, uh, we, we were struggling to convince him to come in. So this man was treated in the ED with oral doxycycline. And we cholera is, is particularly common during the rainy months. So we do a quick test called stool for hanging drop, which was sent to the labs and they did confirm that there was darting motility and it was suggestive of fibrio cholera. So this gentleman, for me to justify uh, a discharge reluctantly, we kept him in the ED for 12 hours and he, uh, his, you can see that the repeat gases after 5 liters of fluid in 6 hours, so 12 hours of time, so he's pH was 7.35, nearly normalized. His potassium was on its way back to normal. Uh, creatinine was starting to tail off and his lactate was significantly better. Um, so in this case, um, I mean, again, it was the biggest challenge was to get, not, not the treatment per se, but just to convince ourselves that he was getting better and even for a discharge against medical advice, he was okay to okay for us to let go of him. He refused to go to a government hospital or to any other place. So finally, with those improving trends, we started him on oral rehydration therapy and we discharged him. So, but the POCT here told us that all his uh, problems of shock, AKI, electrolyte imbalances and the profound lactate rise, everything was on the mend. So there were so many parameters which were really accurately uh, highlighted to us by the point of care and we were able to deal with all of them. So I'm moving on to my last case. Um, so this is a 54 year old gentleman. So he presented to, to our ED with feeling dizzy and he was generally unwell over just three hours of duration. So fairly acute onset of illness. And this gentleman nearly fainted in his living room, but he did not actually collapse onto the floor. 
he held on to furniture he denied any chest pain or discomfort um, he did not have any recent illnesses so he did not have any tinnitus or any feeling of the surrounding spinning so he had never suffered anything like this before so the only past medical history that he had was that he was diagnosed with hypertension 4 years ago and he was on telmisartan uh, 40 mg daily dose which is a modest dose uh, he was a non smoker and he had no other illnesses of note uh, so this gentleman before coming to us had actually gone to a nearby clinic um, it does happen in india not everybody calls an ambulance so he pulled himself up to a nearby clinic and from there he was referred to the cardiologist as um, a very slow pulse rate and possible cardiac syncope for treatment and he was sent to the cardiologist so he he came to our ed and he was looking reasonably well uh, but his heart rate was only 38 his blood pressure was 110 over 70 and he was saturating well on room air um, system review and examination were unremarkable we couldn't find anything else wrong with him so that's is ecg um, so we could uh, see that he was bradycardic he was too young to have a degenerative cause for his uh, bradycardia It, it, didn't, it didn't look like the sto- neither the story nor the ECG finding fitted in with a ischemic event like an inferior wall MI or something else causing his bradycardia. So we could note that he was uh, in profound bradycardia. Um, so this guy wasn't responsive to atropine. Um, so his uh, PCO2 was 39. Um, we did a blood gas which takes a I mean blood gas and chemistry both of which come back within 2 minutes and you could see that his potassium was 7.8 uh, so the cardiology guys were really getting anxious to try other drugs but thankfully we could sense that everything was related to his hyperkalemia possibly caused by the uh, telmisartan that he was on uh, and he had marked symptomatic bradycardia and he was treated with iv calcium and other anti hypokalemic measures um, so they were even contemplating taking him for an angio to see if he had uh, an ischemic event provoking all this um, so thankfully this man responded quite well to our medical treatment with uh, the calcium and the anti hypokalemic measures and he was fine after that um so you could see that uh, with all these three examples and many such pocts in our hd help uh, our patients get appropriate interventions so just that it may be a bit delayed in the absence of uh, the right set of tools the point of care tools um think things may be a bit out of focus and we may be doing we may be tempted to do things as a hit or miss without the point of care test most of our patients in the south of asia have diabetes and hypertension lots of them have these comorbidities and lots of them are arteriopaths they they had coronary artery disease is so rampant renal impairment is so rampant in our population um, and so we, we have many patients coming in for angio needing a contrast in hand cts and we just get a creatinine done first so that we will be able to watch out for future problems so so yes so that will be it from my end so i hope uh, you all can relate to how pocts really aid us in our day to day patient care thank you Thank you Dr. Alagapan for that great presentation and some great case scenarios where point of care testing impacted both the diagnosis and management of those cases uh, that presented to the emergency department so thank you very much um we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers P- please feel free 
it's not too late to enter any questions you may have that you may think of uh, even during the next portion of the presentation. And I'll be happy to address them at the end. We'll have plenty of time uh, for Q&A. So thank you again. Uh, I'll go ahead and proceed with my portion. I'm going to follow this. It's a very good segue into what I want to speak about in a similar fashion, the value of point of care testing in the emergency department, um, uh, much the same as it has been for, for Dr. Lagapan. Um, so as I mentioned previously, uh, I am an emergency physician. I've been board certified in, for over 25 years. Uh, practicing for the last decade only on a part-time basis as faculty at the University of Kansas uh, Medical Center, where we have a um, emergency medicine residency program. Um, in addition to that, uh, since moving to New York City during the peak of the COVID pandemic, I've been moonlighting uh, every other weekend uh, as an attending physician at Lenox Health Greenwich Village in Manhattan. Um, uh, for full disclosure, I am employed by Abbott Point of Care, uh, but I don't feel that this is a conflict of interest, but rather I like to refer to it as more of a confluence of interest because uh, point of care testing is very passionate to me uh, and has definitely changed how I practice emergency medicine and has helped expedite the care uh, and management of patients that present to my ED. So as mentioned, I'm the Senior Director of Global Medical Affairs, and I do think um, Dr. Lagapan again for his presentation and taking time to share his thoughts with us. These are some photos of the hospital where I work in New York City as well as the University of Kansas Health System. Um, so the objectives of my portion of the presentation is to uh, further illustrate the benefit of point of care testing, especially in emergency department settings where overcrowding is an issue and we're seeing this quite a bit uh, in my practice. Uh, I'll demonstrate the benefits of point of care testing in the emergency department to help improve throughput and describe a few other scenarios that I've seen similar to Dr. Lagapan's uh, uh, stories where point of care testing may help improve ED efficiency. So just to give you some demographics, uh, there are over 130 million visits to the emergency department um, annually in the United States. And of those, about 16% of them spend four to six hours in the emergency department. And I know that varies from region to region and country to country. Uh, in some settings, it may be even worse, where patients spend quite a bit of time waiting to be seen and, and getting care. Of the people that we see in the emergency department, it's estimated that about 75% of them will get some type of diagnostic imaging done or diagnostic blood test. And 12% of the patients that are seen end up in hospital admission. Now that varies. That may be close to what I see in the freestanding emergency department in New York City, but I can tell you in the academic center where I practice, our admission rate is much higher because we have a higher acuity of patients. So it varies from where you practice, from, from hospital to hospital, obviously. There we have a lot of cancer patients, a lot of transplant patients, and our admission rate there is upwards of 40 40%. So um, this is significant, especially as we come out of the COVID pandemic, we're starting to see emergency departments become very crowded again, and we're having a lot of problems with overcrowding and boarding, and that can really uh, impact patient care. So there was a survey done, uh, this was published about 10 years ago, the day it's somewhat dated, but they looked at over 360 million weighted ED visits in uh, 364 hospitals across the country. And they found that when you order a blood test, it adds on average about 72 minutes to the patient's length of stay. And if you order any imaging studies, that adds an additional 56 to 64 minutes to their length of stay. And doing a procedure, depending on the procedure, but on average, about 24 minutes are added. So a lot of things that we do will end up impacting the length of stay for that patient. And even just giving something as simple as medications will add 15 minutes for every medication that you give. So and collectively, when you add these together, the patient's length of stay is impacted quite a bit. So if there's anything that can be done to curtail this in the way, you know, point of care testing or whatever it may be to help expedite their care, that's, that's an improvement. So ED overcrowding has been a problem in the U.S. even prior to the COVID pa uh, pandemic. 
it was estimated that over 90% of emergency departments in the U.S. found themselves stressed beyond the breaking point, at least some of the time when they were interviewing nurses and physicians that were working in the ED. And this has been well studied and they found that, you know, this type of um, stress on the system is associated with adverse outcomes and, and improved uh, or in, worsening in, in patient mortality. Um, so boarding uh, is definitely a problem. So many times we have patients that are uh, worked up, a diagnosis is made, they're admitted either to the telemetry unit or to the med search floor or to the ICU, and there are no beds upstairs in the hospital. So we end up boarding patients in the emergency department waiting for a bed to become available. And this is definitely a problem. This is a paper that was published um, in the Academic Emergency Medicine Journal by Dr. Adam Singer actually here in New York City. Uh, and he studied over 41,000 admissions from the emergency department and found that there was a direct correlation between boarding time and mortality. In fact, if your boarding time was less than two hours, there was a 2.5% mortality. And if you were boarded in the emergency department for more than 12 hours, mortality went up to 4.5%. So this was a statistically significant increase in mortality, the longer we were boarding known admissions to the ED, to the hospital that we're, we're holding in the emergency department only to wait for a bed. So this is a graphic that kind of shows the impact that um, boarding can have. So on the left, you can see, you know, a typical uh, well-functioning emergency department doesn't have too many patients in the waiting room and we're not boarding too many patients in the ED so that we can actually see patients and get them triaged and treated appropriately. And this works well when the hospital is not at capacity. So as long as the census of the hospital is less than 85%, it can function efficiently. But as the hospital starts to get stressed, and we saw this both before, during, and after COVID, where the census was such that admitted patients were spending time and boarding in the ED, what happens is other patients are waiting in the waiting room or in the hallways waiting to be seen for even longer because the functional space available in the ED is much reduced. And when you get to the point where the census is over 90%, in many cases, I was practicing where the hospital census was close to 100% and there were no beds anywhere, let alone ICU beds. So when we start boarding these ICU patients in the ED, the ED can become, become very unsafe. Uh, patients get restless. There's more violence that can actually occur. The waiting room is full uh, and, and, and care is impacted very negatively because we're not able to get to the patients and render the care that we need. So anything that you can do to help reduce this will help. So there are many different solutions, obviously. Some are easier than others. The simple thing is reduce the number of people needing to go to the emergency department. And it varies from country to country, but in the U.S. there's been a big um, uh, increase in the use of urgent care settings and outpatient facilities where people are avoiding going to the hospital and they're trying to decentralize care and, and pay patients are showing up with chest pain and abdominal pain. In some cases, it may be actually unsafe where they're showing up to some type of urgent care clinic that's not equipped to take care of a sick cardiac patient or someone with sepsis. But anything that can be done for the lower acuity patients that really don't have true life-threatening emergencies. You know, offering telemedicine has been a big thing. So people are being taken, taken care of, you know, via virtual medicine, via telemedicine more and more nowadays, uh, post-COVID, or these clinics where they can manage some of the lower acuity patients that may help to siphon away some of the patients in the ED so there's not as much overcrowding. And then obviously of the patients there, anything to improve the efficiency of the ED will help reduce this boarding problem and, and discharging patients more quickly. So the sooner that you can make a diagnosis and render care, the sooner you can discharge them and open up that room to see the next patient. So these are all seem very simple, uh, but they're very much, uh, e they're, they're, they're easier said than done. So there are a lot of point of care tests that are utilized. In my practice, um, you know, we use quite a few things. Obviously, glucose is most commonly done. Someone comes in with altered mental status. The first thing we'll do is a blood glucose. 
uh, blood gas analysis in the age of COVID became utilized quite a bit actually because we were looking at oxima, you know, at oxygenation and and respiratory failure and, and and whatnot. So blood gas is one of the more common point of care tests that are being done in most EDs. But now there are other cartridges available where you can do chemistry panels and electrolytes and creatinine is a big one. And that, that's something that does help expedite uh, patient care to just screen for kidney dysfunction early on. Or someone who comes in maybe with a GI bleed where you wanna check their hemoglobin and hematocrit very quickly. Uh, people on anticoagulation can get a rapid INR or pro-time drawn. Uh, lactate, as Dr. Alagapan mentioned, you know, in the setting of sepsis, lactate is very uh, crucial. So when you have patients that present with, you know, fever and so source of infection and meet, you know, the SERS criteria, I think the lactate, ha having this in a point of care solution is very crucial because if you have to wait for the laboratory test to come back, you're oftentimes waiting for 45 minutes or longer. And, and it's very crucial to get the proper antibiotics and fluids on board within that first hour of sepsis management. So point of care lactates, even done in triage when the patient first arrives have been very helpful in identifying septic patients more, more quickly. Uh, obviously point of care troponin is done in almost all EDs uh, to identify uh, STEMI uh, or at least to rule out uh, uh, myocardial, in, myocardial injury. So this helps expedite um, the care and management of, of chest pain patients. Uh, BNP is also very important in screening for CHF or ruling that out and obviously pregnancy tests because oftentimes patients come in with abdominal pain and, and we may not always be able to get a urine sample right away to determine if the patient's pregnant. And that does definitely impact how we work those patients up, uh, we, whether we do an ultrasound or a CAT scan. And I'll, I'll il illustrate this with a, a case scenario later. So there are many benefits to point of care testing. As already mentioned uh, uh, by Dr. Lagapan, you know, you can get more rapid clinical decision making done. It helps to expedite ruling in or ruling out a diagnosis. Uh, it helps determine to choose the right treatment and to monitor a response. So I mentioned sepsis. It's not just the initial lactate to identify sepsis, but repeating the lactate in a couple of hours to make sure the patient's responding to the therapy that you're giving uh, because it is a good measure of uh, tissue oxygenation and, and organ injury. So uh, resource utilization. So I think uh, in, in the settings where we have uh, physicians and you know, mid-level providers that are stressed. I think empowering uh, nursing staff, even in the places where I've worked where point of care testing is being done, you know, we're, we're actually able to utilize resources such that we're not stressing the laboratory personnel by, by, by demanding these tests to be done as quickly as possible, because obviously the staffing can be a concern and they get over, overwhelmed as well. So I think, you know, properly using resources and and nursing staff to get some of the point of care testing to help expedite the treatment is important. Um, and then we, we still will set, end up sending blood to the lab, to the core lab, to get many of the other chemistries that we need, but at least initially being able to get the right resources. And, and that may mean in the setting of sepsis, it, um, activating the sepsis team to come down. Uh, so it's not just the centered around lab, it's also, it, it's also important to help get the right treatment teams there. So if I have a point of care troponin and it's elevated and with or without EKG changes in someone with chest pain, I may activate the, the cardiac team and the cath lab crew more quickly. So it, it helps get the right resources to the patient in a timely fashion. And as I mentioned earlier, discharge. So the sooner we can make the right diagnosis and triage patients and get them treated, I think, the, the better, the faster we can discharge them and open the capacity to see more patients. So there, this has been studied uh, as well, the, the point of care testing and how it can improve outcomes because obviously it's intuitive that the test result turnaround time will be much faster when you have a point of care device available. And time, as I mentioned, time to treatment is very important, whether it's time to thrombolytics in the setting of stroke or of STEMI uh, time to antibiotics and fluids in the setting of septic shock, uh, or even time to diuretics in the setting of CHF, which has been shown to definitely make an impact on uh, outcomes if that's delayed too, too often. So um, 
time to discharge and time to admission can impact, you know, the length of stay in the ED. And as I mentioned, morbidity and mortality ultimately is impacted by this, as well as length of stay in the hospital. So this was studied, and this was a study that a couple of years ago that was published. Um, it was a prospective controlled cluster randomized study in a hospital that actually had fairly wide array of point of care testing. So some places minimize the point of care testing to just troponin or lactate or perhaps creatinine and glucose. In this particular study, uh, they used a quite, uh, quite wide range of point of care testing, including a, a, a metabolic panel, blood gases, CBC, uh, CRP, uh, procalcitonin, troponin, proBNP, and, and, and many other tests. So in this study, they looked at of the patients that required blood tests, uh, there was a 51 minute decrease in the time to get the test results in the patients that received point of care testing, a 17 minute decrease in their length of stay. Uh, there wasn't a change in the wait time in the ED overall, but uh, or in the instance of overcrowding, but ultimately it did decrease the time to getting the results and their stay, the length of stay in the ED. Uh, and, and as mentioned previously, there was a scenario where that was discussed, you know, requiring imaging. Contrast imaging is done quite a bit in the ED, and we mentioned pulmonary embolism. Uh, you know, that's definitely something that can be very time sensitive, especially if the patient's unstable, um, or in the setting of uh, chest pain or abdominal pain. If I need a CT uh, uh, angiogram of the chest to, to rule out an aortic dissection or to rule out a, an abdominal aortic aneurysm, we obviously want to do these types of imaging with contrast, but we not necessarily at the expense of their kidney function. So if the patient is stable, we always prefer to screen them for kidney disease because we know that iodinated contrast can lead to risks of you know, contrast-induced nephropathy. So a point-of-care creatinine in my practice is something we routinely do um, to check the renal function if possible. Now, obviously, if it's life or death and the patient is unstable, it, 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 it's... Uh, something that it's a risk benefit discussion and oftentimes we'll do the imaging and we won't wait for the creatinine because the benefit of the imaging may outweigh the risk of nephropathy but if you do have to wait for a creatinine to come back from the lab it could be up to 60 minutes and that delays the imaging study by 60 minutes which delays the proper therapy so point of care testing can minimize these disruptions in care and improve efficiency in the ed So again, Dr. Singer, I'm quoting him one more time. This is a paper that was uh, studied, uh, published in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine back in 2015. And he looked at 981 patients, almost 1,000 patients with point of care testing. And he compared it to patients, over 1,400 patients that did not get point of care testing. And he found that the median time to completion of the IV contrast CT was reduced by a median of 81 minutes. So that's a you know, an hour and 20 minutes faster, we were able to image those patients with CT contrast enhanced imaging versus when we didn't have point of care testing available. And ultimately in his study, he found that the ED length of stay was reduced from 260 minutes, uh, from 347 minutes to 260 minutes. So, so obviously th this is very well demonstrated as far as improving throughput uh, in getting the necessary imaging done. So I'm going to present a couple of other scenarios, again, uh, that we see quite often in the ED. And I, obviously with COVID, we saw a lot of patients coming in with shortness of breath and chest pain. Uh, and it wasn't always COVID. You know, the question always remains, was, is this acute coronary syndrome? Is there CHF present? Is this a pulmonary embolism? Is it COVID? Is it COVID with a pulmonary embolism? Because we did see a lot of patients with hypercoagulability who presented not only with COVID pneumonia, but also bilateral pulmonary emboli. So this, this was a very difficult scenario that we see quite a bit and still see. So very much uh, so I think point of care is crucial in these situations. And in my practice, when these patients present, and I still do this, you know, oftentimes it's reflexively, we will do a point of care troponin, BNP, D-dimer, and oftentimes a creatinine because many of these patients do end up requiring CT angiography for instance, to rule out PE. So these four tests are almost done automatically in patients that present. And back in Kansas, where I was practicing, nursing staff almost knew to start running these point-of-care tests at the bedside 
because they knew that that's what we were going to need. And as we know, D-dimer does have a very high negative predictive value at ruling out PE. Uh, and we use clinical decision rules, as Dr. Alagapan mentioned. You know, we, we use the Wells score and we, in some patients, we can use the PERC rule to rule out PE and we don't need to do it, even do a D-dimer, but many cases require a D-dimer. But as everyone knows, there is somewhat of a low specificity. So we get a fair amount of false positive D-dimers, which is why I've come to the practice of just getting the creatinine because I know there's a fairly good chance they're going to end up with CT imaging, uh, as I mentioned. So uh, also the CHF, you know, is, is quite important, I think, to rule out. And, and although people with chronic um, uh, compensated CHF, the BMP may not be helpful, but I've found that in, in, at least in ruling out CHF in someone who has come in with shortness of breath who may not have a known history, I think uh, having the ability to get a, D a BMP fairly early is, is helpful. Uh, and it's been shown that you know delays in getting the appropriate treatment to CHF patients can lead to increased mortality and increased length of stay in both the ICU as well as the overall hospital length of stay because of this delay in getting the right, whether it be non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or diuretics, I think it's very important to rule in or rule out the presence of CHF because you can't always do it on the lung exam. And even with COVID pneumonia, you'd see this on the X-ray and sometimes it's difficult to differentiate of how much of it's CHF versus pneumonia because of the, the, the appearance of the X-ray. Another case that we see quite often, and back in Kansas where I was practicing in the academic setting, we had a lot of transplant patients and a lot of people on the transplant list uh, uh, who either failed transplant or they're on the transplant list and they're getting dialysis. And so we would get a lot of patients that either missed dialysis or they skipped dialysis and they would present you know, hypertensive, short of breath, and oftentimes with hyperkalemia. So this is something obviously where you can't afford to wait um, uh, for a lab uh, test to come back. We, we really need to know that the potassium is elevated. Sometimes these pa patients with chronic kidney disease will have surprisingly high potassium levels and really be asymptomatic. And they'll come in with very vague complaints, sometimes just weakness and dyspnea, but that obviously can present itself with a lot of other uh, diagnoses as well. And uh, uh, dysrhythmias are an initial manifestation in many. Uh, they may even have palpitations or present with syncope or chest pain. Um, and, and we can see these EKG changes. In fact, if I see EKG changes in a known kidney patient, I'll treat the patient and try to shift the potassium uh, intracellularly until they can get to dialysis without even waiting for the serum potassium because the EKG changes can, can be quite prominent, but they don't always, uh, they're not always there and it can be a late finding. So you can't always predict it based on the EKG. So I think uh, it's important to get this point of care testing rapidly uh, we do have to be careful, though, because sometimes hemolysis does occur. We will get pseudo-hyperkalemia, so oftentimes we have to confirm it in the lab. But for the most part, I've found it to be very reliable. Uh, when this is elevated, it does help to prompt me to get the EKG and to make sure I treat the patient quickly. And last scenario I'll present, which I've touched on a little bit earlier, is you know, a female that comes in with abdominal pain in the right lower quadrant specifically, because you know, this may require not only blood tests, but obviously imaging. And what type of imaging I do will be very much impacted by the, the result of the pregnancy test. And we can't, as much as we ask patients to give us a urine sample, or sometimes we ask for a stool sample, it's very difficult to get those in a timely fashion. And so um, in patients who are of childbearing age, it's crucial to get a, a pregnancy test quickly because an ectopic pregnancy is definitely high on my list as far as my differential goes. And I will definitely go straight to ultrasound versus CT. But if the patient's not pregnant and I'm concerned on my exam that there may be appendicitis, perhaps a CT scan may be indicated. So getting this uh, definitely will help to differentiate between you know appendicitis or maybe they need a CT to rule out a kidney stone or maybe they have pylo or maybe it's PID or an ovarian torsion, which would require an ultrasound. Uh, and obviously ecto ectopic pregnancy, which can be life-threatening. So the timeliness to diagnosing an ectopic could be, you know, life or death. So I think this is a, another perfect example of chronic care testing is, is, impor is important. So in summary, you know, there are a lot of pressures in the emergency department globally due to overcrowding, which can lead to delays in diagnosis and eventually delays in timely treatment of patients. And this has been shown to, to 
to lead to worse outcomes. So point of care testing, if it's not already in your practice, I encourage you to consider bringing it into your practice because it can help expedite diagnostic imaging. It can help uh, get these patients screened for kidney disease. It can help us you know, get the right type of tests and the right type of treatment to the patient at the right time. Uh, and definitely in this age of overcrowding and, and uh, uh, desire to improve efficiency in the ED, uh, I think point of care testing is, is crucial at getting um, patients uh, test results back more quickly. So that's all I have. Um, I think we have about 15 minutes left. So again, I wanna thank um, Dr. Lagapan for his time uh, presenting earlier and I'll open things up now for questions. And uh, you have a, a Q and A uh, chat box. So feel free to chime in and enter your question and I'll uh, uh, be happy, uh, both of us will be happy to answer your question. So thank you for your time. I hope this uh, webinar was very informative to you. And if you need more information about point of care testing, feel free to contact your, your local rep or, or uh, visit the Abbott website. Thank you once again, and uh, I wish you all a good evening or a good day, depending on where you are. Thank you very much, Dr. Alagapan, Dr. Daplantes. That was uh, very insightful, and thank you for sharing uh, those great patient stories that really uh, bring to life the uh, value of edge and testing. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat box from the audience. Um, so we'll go ahead with the first one of those. Um, thinking of um, congestive heart failure, would it be useful to have a point of care anti BNP test? What do you currently have available in your clinic? Could you talk us through that, please? Maybe we'll go to Dr. Alagopan first. Yep. Uh I think uh, Dr. Chris was already pointing out that it's, it's a huge diagnostic dilemma and it's never straightforward. We have a breathless patient in front of us, um, particularly if they have multiple comorbid conditions, uh, it makes it even more complex. Where I practice, lots of them are diabetics with coronary artery disease and it's, it's always uh, difficult for us to kind of differentiate one from the other on clinical grounds alone. Uh, so, anti pro BNP is something that we commonly use as a point of care in our practice area, um, and it does certainly help. I don't know if uh, you would agree with that. So, it, it's, it's a huge, uh, hugely helpful tool. Yeah, I would have to agree. Um, I think, you know, there's a big debate, and people have been debating, you know, much like with troponin. Uh, and high sensitivity troponin. We have kind of the same dilemma now with technology uh, advancing. You know, the NT uh, Pro BNP has been shown to have higher sensitivity, but just having point of care BNP uh, alone, even the contemporary BNP that's been around for much longer is quite useful. And, and both of them you know, have fairly equal specificities, but I think the, the negative predictive value of both has been demonstrated and has been validated in literature. So I think the ability to rule out CHF with either test, pro BMP or, or the contemporary BMP has been found to be useful. So is there a benefit to having point of care of one versus the other? I can't say that. I think ultimately, yes, it might be helpful, but I don't think it's necessary. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of really similar questions going through um, to the next one. Do you need point of care complete blood count or would you rather send that to the lab? That's a good question. I think, you know, I wouldn't say a point of care CBC is always necessary. You know, the, the white blood cell count is not something that I need to hang my head on as an ED clinician. Uh, it does help us, but as, as everyone knows, you can have an elderly patient or someone immunocompromised that can present septic and not mount much of a white count. And I have a patient with abdominal pain that may have appendicitis and not have a leukocytosis. I think where I found it most crucial in the ED is to have the hemoglobin and hematocrit available in a timely fashion. So if I have a GI bleed, they've had melanic stools for several days and they appear pale and uh, they're on blood thinners, I think getting a point of care hemoglobin hematocrit and getting the blood ordered more quickly and heightening our awareness about the uh, anemia that's present, I think there is a benefit. Most people will argue that 
the CBC turnaround times are not quite that long and the core lab can give us the results fairly quickly. But even a benefit of 15, 20 minutes can make a big difference when you need to either transfuse a patient or if they're on anticoagulation to know that you need to reverse their anticoagulation in a timely fashion. So I, I think that point of care H and H for sure is definitely helpful. I agree. We tend Fine. to use the hemoglobin more than uh, anything else. And of course, the INR are in the same breath. Uh, we have lots of uh, liver disease patients, chronic liver disease patients, or patients who are on warfarin. So, and if they come with a bleed, point of pair, INR is quite useful for us. So, those two more than the CBC, that's a much more useful. Thank you both very much. Uh, on a similar note, it's a short and crisp question. Is D-dimer a lab test? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so D-dimer is, is a blood test that we use quite often. Um, it, it has a very high negative predictive value for thrombobolic disease. We use it quite a bit in chest pain patients to help rule out the presence of either venous uh, thrombosis in the legs or venous thromboembolism to the lungs. Uh, it does have a very low specificity, however, so there are false positives and many things can cause the D-dimer to be elevated like sepsis and trauma and cancer, uh, pregnancy. So in, the, in, in certain populations, it can be troublesome and it may not be as reliable, but in, in other populations where I think you're trying to minimize the use of imaging, it's very helpful. Now, not all places have a point of care or D-dimer available. Uh, I know we don't, Abbott doesn't have such a test, but I think having a D-dimer is, is very uh, helpful and has changed uh, how we practice, you know, emergency medicine for sure. And I've mm -hmm. used it in my practice quite a bit. Thank you. Um, I'll go to the next question. This is a, um... On behalf of a point of care coordinator, how do you ensure the quality control of the point of care device at your hospital's ET setting? Um, we, we rely on the uh, about uh, another point of care providers to guide us through how it's done, and they often lays with our central labs. So we leave the responsibility with the uh, lab people rather than with our own nurses uh, and uh, our company reps are, are quite helpful in making sure it's uh, done in the right way. Thank you. So between the lab, the point of care coordinator team and the, and the provider team really ensuring end-to-end -end continuity of service. Chris, um, how do you ensure quality control in your practice? Uh, yeah, that's much. So in the freestanding ED where I practice, we um, we don't use point of care at that particular facility. But in Kansas City, where I practiced previously, uh, they do much like, as was mentioned, coordinate with the lab and the point of care coordinator and the the uh, the the uh, industry representative comes in as well. And there's quality control testing that's done regularly. I, I don't manage that part of that practice at that hospital, but it's done in a regular fashion as far as uh, quality control checks and and uh, you know, making sure that the, the, the machines are properly functioning, but it's done in a regular cadence. And that's very important to point out that this is a, you know, a test that needs to be, have adequate quality control measures uh, to be done. I think Thank there was one other question much. about. Yep, uh, going back to the clinical questions, do we need lactate and creatinine on every patient in the ED? What's your view? Every patient may be a bit of an overkill. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously, we need to do it for the right patients, but lots of them do need it. And, I mean, it depends on where you practice. Where we are, as I said, uh, CKD is rampant, so is uh, sepsis. So we do do it on a lot of patients, but still, you can't justify doing it on every patient. Yeah, I think I agree. You know, I don't know that every patient, we, we, we do lactate very selectively on patients because 
you know, it just depends on the setting. If they have uh, suspicion for infection and we're worried about sepsis, um, we'll do this. Um, it's not routine. I think we have to be careful that we, we don't rely too much on lactate on everybody, but I think if they have a fever and they meet service criteria or they other other signs, uh, whether you use a, you know, Q-SOFA or whatever the screening, there's decision rules we use or criteria. The nurses actually use those in triage. They, if they have any of these signs and symptoms and meet these criteria, they'll do an, a point of care lactate uh, almost automatically on those patients to screen them. Uh, but again, the, the flip side of that is there are patients that present with sepsis who don't produce lactate. So you can't rely too much on lactates. There's a small percentage of patients that actually may have a lactate within normal limits and go on to have sepsis or septic shock. And that was actually a study that was published over a decade ago that looked at uh, a lactemic sepsis. Uh, the other situations where I've used lactates is in the setting of seizure. Uh, someone comes in altered LOC and we're not sure if they had a syncope or fainted or they had the seizure. Very much, uh, very commonly after grand mal seizure, the lactate will rise very high, like eight, nine or 10, and then it'll fall very quickly. So it's kind of a smoking gun. And I've used it sometimes in that way to, to look to see if they have any evidence that they may have had a seizure. Diabetic ketoacidosis is another one where they will come in typically with lactic acidosis. So I, I think there are a lot of settings and traumas we do lactate. So creatinine, again, as mentioned, renal disease for sure. To screen for it prior to imaging, we do this routinely. Anybody I think I'm gonna do a CT that's gonna require contrast, I'll do the point of care creatinine right away because I don't wanna wait an hour to get the creatinine back to decide which type of CT I want to order. Um, and screening for kidney disease, you know, if it's not something that's going to require imaging, we can wait sometimes for the core lab creatinine to come back. But as the doctor mentioned, you know, renal disease is very prominent and actually is increasing. Uh, we have our aging population and renal disease, it's estimated to become the fifth leading cause of death by 2040. We're getting a lot more patients coming in with kidney disease and it's only going to get worse. So I think the diagnosis and recognition and screening for this is very important. Thank you both very much. That brings us to the end of the audience questions today. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Alagopan and Dr. Davlantes for your great presentations. Um, I pass back to you for closing comments. Thank you, Roxanne, for moderating the questions and uh, for organizing this uh, webinar. Again, I hope everyone uh, found this very informative and I wanna thank uh, uh, Dr. Alagopan again for his time and his expertise. And uh, thank you all for joining us, and uh, we wish you well. Thank you.